increased assessment value. And um, the loan program is called the Rumble Community Reinvestment Loan, and that provides uh, zero interest loans up to an amount of $100,000 that can be used for revitalizing properties. So things like facade improvements, new windows and roofing, um, landscaping, lighting, signage, anything that will help improve the appearance of the property. Um, so to report on progress to date, um, there we've had several properties, I come on in, um, improved in uh, these corridors over the years. About 14 or so of them have been able to take advantage of the property tax credit. Um, that's not a real high number, but I think part of the issue there is that a lot of these older properties, the owners want to do some smaller scale improvements, but they don't really have the money to invest to reach the $100,000 um, limit that you need for the property tax credit. Uh, but nevertheless, we've had about 14 or so, um, and go to the next slide. Uh, and then uh, we've had a lot of people take advantage of the Rental Community Reinvestment uh, Loan Program. That's about 40 properties so far that have been able to utilize that. And they cover a pretty wide range of uses from offices, retail stores, a lot of sort of auto related uses, self storage facilities, et cetera. So um, I can share with you a few uh, success stories. This is a property up in Glen Burnie that took advantage of these programs, and you can see the before and after pictures. And here's another one also in Glen Burnie. This is the Honeybee Diner that you all might know. Really nice improvement there. So um, those are the successes. Some of the challenges that we're finding in these areas is that um, a lot of the properties along these older corridors are very small, so when you're talking about redevelopment, um, it's difficult to work within the site constraints. Um, also because they're small, often a developer might want to do some assembly of several lots in order to be able to do a significant redevelopment project, but that requires working with a lot of different property owners, so that can sometimes make it more challenging. Um, these are almost all located on state highways, so if you want to initiate any kind of street, street scape improvements, you've got to coordinate with state highway, which is fine, but just sometimes can make it more challenging because you're competing with um, jurisdictions all over the state for limited state funding. And some of the areas also have uh, sort of demographic or economic challenges compared to other parts of the county that make it a little harder to encourage developers to want to go into these communities and redevelop properties. So um, those are some of the challenges that we're kind of thinking about these days, how we can address them. And so moving on, another um, tool that we have that's a little more recent is sustainable communities. And this was a state uh, program that was put in place in uh, 2010 adopted by the State General Assembly, and um, it's a designation, it's an official state designation, so it doesn't automatically come with any funding, um, but if you apply for and are awarded this designation, then that makes projects um, within these areas eligible for a range of revitalization programs that are administered by the state, typically by Department of Housing and Community Development or Department of Commerce. Um, and the goal here, again, is revitalization, focusing investments on areas that um, are existing communities that have seen past investments that, for various reasons, are starting to decline. Um, the state is really big on local government leveraging and private property owner leveraging with these programs. So this, you can apply for and be awarded some state fundings, but they're <coughs> typically looking for some kind of leverage from the local government. So we have three of them in the county, and they're shown here, Brooklyn Park, Glen Burnie, and Odin's with Severn. And um, these designations are put in place for five years, and then after five years, if you want to keep it, you have to reapply uh, to the Department of Housing and Community Development. So um, just the, within the past six months, um, we have gotten both the Brooklyn Park and Glen Burnie areas have been so they'll retain that status for another five years. And uh, two Severn areas up for renewal um, this fall, I think. So we'll pursue that as well. 
Okay, so here are the three R. Um, each one of these uh, applications comes with, uh, uh, you have to prepare an action plan, which is sort of like a mini small area plan or community plan with goals and action strategies uh, focused towards revitalization of the areas. Uh, those plans are all online on our website under community revitalization if you want to look at them. Um, these bullet points here are just some of the key um, sort of goals that come out of those action plans for the three sustainable communities. And uh, another even more recent uh, revitalization tool or program that we've been participating in is the Baltimore Regional Neighborhood Initiative. So this was passed by the State General Assembly in uh, 2014 and the goal again is revitalization but the state is particularly trying to promote cross-jurisdictional cooperation between Baltimore City and the neighboring jurisdictions, so Anne Arundel County, Howard, Baltimore County. Um, uh, so um, we, the City of Baltimore, and many, many stakeholder groups um, got together in 2015 and uh, put together a vision and action plan for an area that we coined the name of Baybrook for, so it covers three communities, in Anne Arundel it covers Brooklyn Park, and in the city of Baltimore it covers Brooklyn and Curtis Bay, if you're familiar with those communities. So collectively they are now known <coughs> as the Greater Bay Brooklyn <coughs> area, and what another um, important thing that came out of this effort was that a new uh, a nonprofit community development organization was formed called the Greater Bay Book Alliance, or GBA, so if you live up in North County you've probably heard of uh, GDA, um, and they are now uh, spearheading the community engagement and outreach and all the uh, fun funding, seeking funding for a whole variety of projects. Um, there are a lot of people involved in it. Um, I'm involved on behalf of planning and zoning. Um, Aaron, who's going to talk in a few minutes, participates on behalf of Rundle Community Development Services, and Keisha Hayden, who is our economic development corporation, participates as well. Um, the county's workforce development um, organization and many civic associations up in that area. So um, listed on this slide are a few of the projects to date that have been accomplished using um, this burning funding. So the General Assembly allocated a fair chunk of money over the next several years. Um, all the jurisdictions or CDCs such as Greater Bay Brook um, can apply for funding for different projects each year. We have various different programs through GBA. We have a block unification program, a spruce up program, and then individual targeted um, revitalization projects that are coming out of that. So um, one of the big ones that the county accomplished, which is, is not, you know, one of those sexy things to talk about, but it was the road and abatement program. Mm -hmm. And we got money funding and the health department used it and hired a lot of contract staff and they went out and did mm -hmm. a very thorough and extensive uh, survey throughout Brooklyn Park looking for um, sources of rodents. Yep. And as part of that, they also provided uh, for free um, the very sturdy covered trash receptacles um, and did educational outreach to property owners and residents up there about how to maintain your trash and your property to help reduce the rodent population. And they did a follow-up survey a year later and the results were uh, pretty spectacular. So um, that was one great success story that came out of that. So looking forward, what do we, what do we need to do now? Um, we need to come up with some more ID for some stronger development centers to encourage developers to start to look at some of these older and underutilized properties. Um, you know, often they are going to look first for greenfield sites or unapproved properties because they're often easier to develop and um, they haven't already been subdivided, so they're not dealing with multiple property owners. So um, it takes um, some pretty serious um, incentives, I think, to get people to look at some of these older properties that are declining and that need to be improved. Um, we're working on identifying um, key opportunity sites so we can maintain an inventory of those and, and make sure that potential developers are aware of where these are. Um, 
we need to focus, I think, on better use of public-private partnerships and um, focus on opportunities for adaptive reuse. So um, some of the initiatives that um, we're working on this year, uh, we've put together a redevelopment work group that consists of developers who do this type of redevelopment as well as some attorneys and real estate professionals and other people. And I'm working with them to brainstorm ideas in terms, right now primarily in terms of code revisions that we can make to, uh, to uh, either uh, create more flexibility or provide more incentives for the type of redevelopment that we're trying to promote. And we're also talking about additional financial incentives or programs that we could put in place. Um, I mentioned before, we're working on identifying some key opportunity sites. And another thing we want to do is, is something I'm calling targeted redevelopment studies. And this would be a focus on very specific sites that seem to have potential for redevelopment, either because of their location, uh, their size, their um, proximity to certain amenities, their function in the community, or whatever. Um, so, uh, and we're probably going to need funding to do these, so we have uh, requested uh, a line item in our department's operating budget, which hopefully will pass this summer, and we would use that to hire consultants to help us with some of these. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yes. Can I hang around? Yes. I did not have a chance to tell you, but we just finalized the review of, the, of our budget, and there's $100,000 in your budget to do Great. So it's made it into the budget. <laughs> <laughs> the county council has to pay. So go lobby your council members. Um, so, and we also want to take advantage of state funding where we can. So recently I put in an application for a technical assistance grant through the State Department of Housing and Community Development. And uh, this funding, if, you, if we get it, could be used to do one of these focus studies on a particular block that's located in the Glen Burnie Town Center um, that needs some help. Um, so the challenge with these targeted studies, I think, is that you have to have participation by the property owners or you're potentially going to come up with a, a redevelopment concept that's going to go nowhere. And sometimes the property owners want to participate with you and brainstorm ideas, and sometimes they don't. So. That's sometimes a stumbling block for those. So I'm going to stop there. So hopefully that gives you some idea of what our needs are and um, what we're working on and some of the newer initiatives that we're going to get going. And um, do you, Elizabeth, do you want to take questions now or at the end? I think now would be great if you don't mind. And then Jamie would have one. Yeah. Um, so uh, you said strengthening the incentives. Uh, just, can you just tell us what some of the incentives um, for the development of incentives are for those? Um, um, I think you had a couple of things that had development incentives. Right. So we're looking at the development requirements <coughs> and ways that we can um, adjust them for specific areas, so targeted redevelopment opportunity areas, to make it easier for a developer to come in and do a redevelopment project. So that could be adjusting or relaxing certain requirements, again, not countywide, but in targeted areas. Um, it could include incentives that are more on the financial side, like, um, you know, reductions in certain fees or costs to redevelop, okay. so that kind of thing. So I, I, I'm just, I, I get you, those are the things that you would consider. I'm curious, what are there now? It's, I don't know that the incentive programs are working. Um, what's there now that's not working? Um, well, the, again, the tools that I went over, I wouldn't say they're not working because there are people that have used them. Okay. Um, but when you start to look at some of the some of the underutilized properties, they have challenges that are probably going to need more than this sort of relatively small um, pot of tools that we have in place right now. So I think we'd want to try to expand on those. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it gives me an idea of the, what you're thinking anyway. Yeah, thanks. For Greater uh, Baybrook, uh, it, you were saying there were nonprofits involved. Is that like Habitat for Humanity or 
Uh, are they working in conjunction with this alliance as well? And others? Yes, they are. Habitat is um, uh, Chesapeake Habitat for Humanity, and I'm sure I couldn't name them all. There's mm -hmm. a large number of nonprofits and civic associations. Karen sitting next to me has mm -hmm. been involved on behalf of um, Oakland Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you find the same thing in other areas of the county? I'm in Pasadena. I'm, I haven't heard of any uh, nonprofits helping us out. Um, there are, but not that would take advantage of the specific Bernie program, the Baltimore Regional Neighborhood Initiative, because right. you, it's it's focused on areas contiguous to Baltimore City. Right. So, which for us is really Brooklyn Park. Yeah, but the Curtis Bay area comes down into the Marley Neck that, that I'm involved with. Right. That's the reason why I asked. Right. So. We do have a couple couple of our um, commercial revitalization overlay districts are in Pasadena. There's one on Mountain Road, okay, um, and there's one on Fort Smallwood Road. And there's probably been four or five properties on those two corridors that have been able to take advantage facade, of uh, the tax credit oh, or facade stuff. improvement. Okay. Two or three, I think three Boyle Farms. Boyle Farms has really latched onto these programs. Mm -hmm. I think we've had three different Boyle like Farms that. stores take okay. advantage of it. Interesting. Yes. Island, um, the redevelopment work group, is it, a, is it always set or is the city <coughs> going to be contributing with that as well? Well, I, yeah, it's already formed, um, but I can certainly keep um, you all informed <coughs> about uh, what we're doing and if you can contact me if you're interested in um, any particular aspect of it. Right. Yeah, it's to kind of that same question, but I'm not too clear. He was asking um, the targeted redevelopment study. Is that I know you have um, the, 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 the sustainable communities, but the targeted ones you don't have put together other than the town center one. Well, we can do these anywhere in the county that we want. Right. They don't have to be. Th th this is just some studies that we want to initiate, okay. so they don't have to be in a sustainable. They don't have to be in a revitalization corridor, but those geographic areas are where we're focusing a lot of our attention. But we may want to do one. You know, there, there's no constraints on where we might do one. We're just looking for opportunity sites that could potentially benefit from having a uh, redevelopment concept plan put together, working with the county and the property owners. Questions. One is: Has, has uh, the county considered lowering that hundred thousand dollar threshold? Obviously, or, or benchmark, so that more property yeah. owners would be able to take advantage of, of mm -hmm. for smaller budget uh, uh, projects. And two, is, is staff looking at any particular other communities that have been revitalized outside of our county as um, kind of a go-to or best practices or mm -hmm. successes? Are there any particular ones that you know that you might? recommend to us to look at? Um, I can send you some resources if anybody's interested in looking at them. I can probably send some to Elizabeth. Yeah, there's case studies all around the area, a lot in Baltimore City, which is a little bit different because it's so much more urban than some of the areas we're looking at. Um, a lot of good examples in Arlington, um, Montgomery County, you know, other places around the um, to answer your first question, we did look at that maybe, I'm thinking three or four years ago, it was under Steve Shear's administration. Um, we looked at lowering the limit to qualify for the property tax credit, and where we ran into a snag was with the State Department of Assessments and Taxation because they need a certain amount of increase in assessment value to kick in an out-of-cycle reassessment by them and the property owner needs the reassessment and able to determine the tax credit and whether they qualify. So um, we were looking at lowering it to 50,000, but that, that was the problem. So for right now, um, it's still at 100,000. But um, Economic Development Corporation did uh, raise the limit for the loan program. It used to be 50,000. Less, I think. 25 at one point. 25 initially. It was 50, and now that's been raised to 100,000. So, as I said, there's probably 40 properties that have been able to make some pretty nice improvements using that program. So, um, so 
in your incentives, uh, it, it just triggered my memory of some conversations I've had with people uh, looking for opportunity zone investments, um, which is a federal tax shelter um, and investment strategy that's national. Um, I see in Anne Arundel County, we have three areas that seem to overlap, and that's big money, that's like Wall Street money is looking for this tax shelter. Uh, so if you're not overlaying where the opportunity zones are with this, maybe a source of money there. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of people chasing those. Yeah, we're, and Wes can possibly speak to this more, we're not sure how well we're gonna be able to take advantage of those. Um, one of one of them, the one in the western part of the county, covers part of the Fort Meade base, which right. the county's not really going to do anything with that, and right. it all it looks oh, it very. Oh, to cover part of the uh, Town Center too, though, from what I can see. Um, it covers Tipton Air, no, not the OTC. It covers no. Fort part of Fort Meade, um, the Tipton Airport, and then most of it is the Tucson Wildlife Refuge. <laughs> And there's one the other one's basis, in Brooklyn right? Park, which you know, maybe maybe something will come out of that. The the boundaries are because the boundaries were based on census tracts that met certain criteria, they're not the, they're not um, the way a planner would draw them and they to us they don't make great sense, but this is federal law and that's how they were formed and we didn't really have any say so in it. So uh, we'll see. You know, maybe Wes can come up with some innovative ideas for, <laughs> for taking advantage of those so opportunities. Just to be that, so you're familiar with that's what everybody else knows. Uh, it says there's one in Odenton and three in Brooklyn Park. <coughs> yeah. Four tracks. Yeah, it's three it's three different census tracks. Thank you, Lou. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, my contact questions? information is here if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And Mr. Hager has a few words he'd like to say. Yeah, just before. very quickly in relation to this topic. There's two yeah. things I'd like yes. to ask you to keep in mind as you think about this presentation and the information that was imparted. First of all, Lynn is managing a program that's only been in existence since late October. Uh, before this, a revitalization activity took place. Uh, in, in, a, in a less directed manner. So this is something we, we've been able to do now with just a limited focus, and, and I think we've been able to do an awful lot thanks to Lynn and, and some of the efforts that other department staff have put into this, and, and the fact that we've been able to uh, <coughs> attract the support from our current county executive for this, as you see, with the money that was approved in this year's budget. So these, these are very good things. We've been able to do a lot in a very, very short period of time. We feel pretty good about that. The second thing is, the areas that have been targeted for, re for revitalization <coughs> are not monolithic. They're not all the same. Okay, just because they're all being targeted for revitalization doesn't mean that each and every one has the same challenges and the same issues. Uh, they, they didn't become challenged through the same processes or because of the same things either. So we have to look at different things in, in all of these different areas. And some of the reasons that we are, some of the ways that we're trying to re-energize re, uh, re and reinvigorate those communities has to do with planning and zoning things. But the reasons that they're in these situations that they are right now, for the most part, have nothing to do with planning and zoning. So we're just trying, we're, we are trying with the tools we have available to, uh, to, to effectuate a positive gain in these areas. So, <coughs> Remember, we're, we're using a tool to try to effectuate a positive gain that wasn't the result of, or wasn't the cause of why they're in that situation today. Thank you. Next is Ms. Aaron, who is with Community Development and Affordable Housing. Hi. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm Erin Karpowitz. I'm the policy coordinator for Orlando Community Development Services, which is the <coughs> county's nonprofit housing and community development agency. We were uh, privatized um, back in 1993 um, as part of um, kind of a, an effort to um, reduce government, um, the government agencies, and so we contract with the county to administer a lot of their federal housing and community development programs, but we also now administer county um, housing and community development dollars, as well as state dollars. And we also um, administer the county's local development council funding. 
Um, all in all, with the federal and county dollars, it's about 11 to $12 million each year. Um, that doesn't include the LDC funding and the competitive state grants that we go after every year. Um, I'll go. So I'm just gonna kind of briefly go over what we do. Not a lot of people know um, who we are and the types of programs and initiatives that we support. We support a lot of partners and subrecipients that get grant funding from us, but then we also um, have a lot of, we develop and, and <coughs> administer a lot of in-house programs. And so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about both. Um, in under community development and neighborhood revitalization, we really um, try to target our resources, and when I talk about resources, I'm not just talking about funding. Um, we target some of our expertise, provide technical assistance and capacity building in those neighborhoods that may need us. For example, when we talked about the Greater Baybrook Alliance, we were kind of one of the first um, groups and first entities in there, helping them get started on the ground, providing the technical assistance, helping them cobble together operating dollars, helping them get financial um, systems and, and their bylaws and things like that all set up. So we saw a need in the area. We've been working in the area for a long time and saw a need for an on-the-ground community development organization. And when that Bernie initiative came together, we were, we were there. Um, another group that we've helped has been um, the Spring Meadows community out in the Severn area. Older, um, condominiumized, townhomes um, <coughs> under common ownership, really struggling with delinquent, um, delinquent uh, condo fees and have a lot of needs. And so we've been able to work with them, help them get their collections up, apply for some grants to do some um, revitalization of the roofs and other needed improvements. Um, but that's, that's kind of the TA that we provide. And then we also provide funding, um, whether it be our rehabilitation dollars, or we also administer to subrecipients a lot of public service dollars. And that's a really small amount of our budget, but it's very popular. And so because those funds are so limited, we try to target it in those targeted neighborhoods. So we do things like the Boys and Girls Club out um, in the Mead Village community in Severn, or we might fund the Chesapeake Art Center scholarship program. So kids in Brooklyn Park can get scholarships to do ballet or violin lessons. Um, we also do things like an eviction prevention program in the Glen Burnie area through our partner, Calvary Chapel. Um, another thing we do in our revitalization areas is housing rehabilitation. Um, wherever we can target a specific program in Brooklyn Park, we've really targeted both an owner-occupied rehab program where we help homeowners rehab their houses, but then also we go and acquire dilapidated um, homes that are throughout the community, specifically in like the Arundel neighborhood or Arundel Village area, and then also Brooklyn Heights. And you can see that's a before on the left-hand side and an after. That was one of the properties that the community have been wanting to do something with for a long time. We use some of our um, <coughs> state grant funds and some of our federal grant funds to go in and acquire it and rehab it. And then we um, actually rent it out to low and moderate income households as affordable quality workforce housing. And we've done about 54 units um, um, that we've acquired and rehabbed, and then we've done about 39 owner-occupied units in that community. As you can see, we're not just doing the insides of these units, we're really trying to have an impact on the outside, a visual transformation. So that we have stable, affordable units that are you know, lead-free, there's a lot of lead up there. Um, but also there's a visual transformation that hopefully eventually inspires um, <coughs> private investors to make the same types of facade improvements as the market catches up. <coughs> um, we also do um, historic preservation projects and public facilities in the Severn area. Um, one thing the community has been crying out for a long, long time to do a community center or some kind of a project to serve the, the youth. There's a high, uh, a very high um, population of school-aged children um, with a lot of needs in the Severn area, especially in that Spring Meadows, Still Meadows, Pioneer Drive area. And um, there's also a need for a senior center. We don't, the county doesn't have a senior center out that way. And a lot of the, they've been taking a census at the other senior centers 
we're finding that seniors are traveling from the area to go to other senior centers and there's a need there. There's a need for nutritional services, quality after school activities, fun activities for the seniors, um, and also people are really in need of just space to do things like have basketball games and things. So um, some of our federal funding that we get through the U.S. Department of HUD um, and some of the local development council money has been set aside to finally um, make this a reality. So we're really excited about that. And that will be co-located on the Van Bachland School property. Um, and so it's using you know, some sort of hopefully sort of land that gets surplus by the Board of Education. And this just you know shows those our, our a lot of our federal funding, especially our community development block grant funding, has to be used um, in communities that serve low income people or for programs that serve low income people. And so this shows all the co the um, the colored in shows those census tracts that have a higher than typical percentage of low and moderate income households in those census tracts, and the county as a whole does. And it really mirrors the, the three revitalization areas that Lynn talked about when she was talking about the county sustainable community areas. And we try to be consistent with our friends at the planning department and concentrate our very limited dollars because we don't have that $12 million doesn't go very far when you're talking about capital projects. So we try to concentrate it in you know the, the Brooklyn Park area, Severn, and then Glen Burnie. And in Glen Burnie, we don't have a lot of specific targeted um, programs, but we do our regular countywide programs in that area and target the marketing of those programs. And I'm going to talk in a minute about those um, countywide programs. Like right now, this is home ownership. One of our big thing, goals is to promote home ownership, um, and in, in order to do that, um, you know, we want to promote affordable home ownership and also stable home ownership. We don't want to just get people into homes just to get them into homes. They're going to do home ownership. They need to be able to afford it. So we are really big on home ownership counseling. We administer that in-house. It's free. It's available to anybody in the county, regardless of income. Um, and we use uh, we assemble a, a few different sources of grant funding to support that. And we support about four to five hundred people a year, households per year, in that program. We also provide um, down payment and low income, or I'm sorry, down payment and closing cost assistance to low income home buyers um, who are qualified to go through our home ownership counseling program and you do have to income qualify for that. And we provide um, a property rehabilitation program where we provide low interest financing, also technical assistance and a lot of care holding with the homeowners. It's, we serve a lot of elderly people. You don't have to be elderly to uh, be qualify for that program, but our occupants tend to be elderly and it's a great way of helping to make sure that they remain in their homes um, in, a, in a safe environment. We also have some accessibility modification funding where we help um, homeowners who have an accessibility um, disability or have a disability, a mobility disability make those accessible modifications. Um, we also do foreclosure prevention counseling to help people stay in their homes if they're running into problems paying their mortgage. And we finally, we do a financial literacy program where we're educating a lot of our low-income residents on um, the basics of finan finances. Um, they may have different goals. One may be as simple as opening a bank account, but one may be as high as you know, eventually becoming a homeowner. And um, we, that's free and that's available um, to everyone. We do target it to some of our partners, some of the, um, you know, like the Housing Commission and the public housing residents or some of our um, homeless providers, but we also have seminars that are open to the public and um, on a range of topics. Our big popular one is understanding your credit because we find that people, not just when they're going to buy a house, but when they're going to find a quality rental unit, one of the biggest barriers to finding that unit is having good credit, so we help them with that. Rental strategies, um, you know, a big thing is um, affordable rental opportunities. Nearly half of all renters in Anne Arundel County are overburdened and pay more than 30% of their income for housing, but that statistic is even more pronounced for low and moderate income households. 57% of our extremely low income households are severely cost burdened, which means they pay over 50% of their wages for housing. And another 15% of those folks are, co are moderately cost burdened. So that's 
that's a family making $28,000 um, a year for a family of four. But even for people who are making 71,000, a working you know, workforce family, 27% um, of those are moderately cost burdened and 29% of those families are severely cost burdened when it comes to um, renting. So today there are another statistic and we're actually in the process of um, finalizing a consultant agreement where we have a market analysis coming down the road in a couple months to really quantify what the need is in the county. Um, but in the meantime, I think it's clear that there's a need. There's 17,000 households on the waiting list for affordable housing um, through the Housing Commission, whether it be housing choice vouchers or units in some of the public housing communities or units in some of the newly developed privately owned units that are controlled by the Housing Commission. And that's an unduplicated count. So some, yes, may be on multiple waiting lists, but they, they went and cleaned the list and that's unduplicated people on those waiting lists. Um, these are what um, the state of Maryland and a lot of housing professionals call opportunity areas. Not to be confused with opportunity zones, it's actually kind of the flip side of that. So uh, um, we were a little dismayed in the opportunity zone because now it confuses people. Because this has been kind of an idea or policy um, guideline that's been brewing for a long time among housing, especially fair housing advocates, HUD, and other housing professionals that you know it's important to go into revitalization areas and preserve the existing stock of affordable housing but on the flip side of that we need to create affordable housing opportunities in, in areas where there are there are other opportunities not just concentrating low-income people in some of the older areas and not having a huge concentration of low-income housing in the same you know older um, inner ring suburban communities where affordable housing has traditionally been um, concentrated. And so the state of Maryland in their um, low income housing tax credit um, program when they award low income housing tax credits, which is any developer that comes in is gonna, um, they're gonna need that money, that state money to make the units affordable and give a supply side subsidy and make those units affordable to the tenants. Whenever they come in, they, they're gonna get they need to go through the state's process and the, the state has given some priority to developing new units in these areas and, and these are just the areas in Anne Arundel County and we took out those areas that were not in for this map we took out those areas that are not in priority funding areas so I'm just gonna go back um, so our goals here are to create affordable rental opportunities um, and, and renovate existing units but then we also have a goal to create new units and areas of opportunity. And there are you know, projects that we've done that for, Burger Square is one in Western um, Anne Arundel County and kind of the Odenton area and Severn area. Um, that, but those projects are few and far between because there's not a lot of developable land or affordable land. It's hard for developers to get that land and, and make it into affordable housing. So that's, that's one of the barriers that we've identified. Um, under ending homelessness, that's a big goal. ACDS is the lead agency um, for the county on coordinating um, its homelessness strategy. We coordinate with the city of Annapolis um, over 60 different nonprofit and government agencies that work on, in the um, ending homelessness field. And we apply for over $3 million in competitive um, grant funding to support those efforts every year. And this just kind of gives you an idea of some of the um, projects that we do. One thing that we do is um, we provide rental vouchers for homeless people, chronically homeless people, as well as families, rapid rehousing. Um, we support Sarah's House, which is the emergency shelter um, in um, the, the, uh, on Fort Meade, and then also lighthouses in the city of Annapolis. Um, <coughs> We also um, do some prevention work. I mentioned earlier that we do eviction prevention and we do um, some other, we fund some other eviction prevention, not just in Glen Burnie, but also kind of in the Annapolis area. Um, we also have goals to support the special needs. Oh, I, don't, I guess I must have missed the slide on that. I, I apologize. But we do things um, to provide financing and technical assistance to nonprofits that work with 
people who have developmental disabilities, mental disabilities, physical disabilities, and they create group homes um, in, in different communities so that the people can live in the community um, in a group home setting, and um, we provide some of the financing for that. So what the ARC of uh, the Chesapeake, and um, I'm trying to think, Bella McCree is another partner, and also Omni House is another partner that comes to mind. So um, that's kind of a, a quick and dirty of what we do. Um, I probably missed some things. But the other thing that we do is the administrator of federal funds, we have to submit to the US Department of Housing and Urban Development a five-year consolidated plan. And part of that is also doing a fair housing plan. And so I think I've talked with some of you already um, about that <coughs> fair housing plan, where we've identified impediments to fair housing and um, we need to then develop strategies to address those impediments. But we also have to say, okay, these are these are the county's five-year goals around housing and community development, and um, this is what we're gonna do to reach those goals. Here are our strategies. And we have to do that every five years because then every year that we apply to HUD for the funding, anything we apply for has to relate back to one of those goals or strategies. And so we're about to embark on that now for next year. Around this time next year, we'll be publishing a draft, our next draft five-year plan. And we kind of look at this as, you know, it, it, it's a complement or a supplement to the general development plan. Um, but we do have to do it every five years. And just some things that we're, um, you know, exploring um, in the, as part of that planning process. This is by no means solid. We are just beginning that planning process. But one thing um, we're looking at is um, to continue our investment in those three revitalization areas. Again, our funds are really limited. We're, we're open to exploring other areas that you all think might be <coughs> revitalization, but we have to balance that with um, limited funds. So if you have ideas, um, I'm all ears. Um, we also are looking to um, you know, expand our financial investments. What kind of new financial investments can we use to subsidize the creation of affordable units? Are there land use um, changes that could um, and zoning changes that would allow for the production of affordable units. Um, and, um, and maybe that could be something that Lynn's developer group, revitalization group looks at. Um, and then also, um, oh, I, I do want to say the financial investments the county executive did today in his budget address announced that he's including in his, um, in his budget additional funding to do affordable housing, so that's good news. And then also, of course, the preservation of existing um, affordable units. We will be looking to spend our federal dollars on doing some of the um, redevelopment of older properties, the Mead Village um, public housing over in West County. That is going through a redevelopment, and we'll be using some of our federal funds to do that. And then, of course, we want to continue to support our um, homeownership programs and keeping people in sustainable home ownership opportunities as well as promote financial self-sufficiency. And then um, finally, uh, looking at increasing our rental vouchers, um, our tenant-based rental assistance, um, so that people have a means to pay for safe and stable housing. But that also has to be coupled with, especially if you're talking about the very low income and the chronically homeless, um, some of the, the, the case worker um, supports and, and um, case management. So. Yeah. Karen, can you explain a little bit for uh, the differentiation? Some of us are familiar, but some of us aren't, as far as affordable housing work and workforce housing. Sure. Well, and it depends on who you're talking to, but that's a great question. Our funding <coughs> is um, our federal funding is limited. Usually, if you're if you're like rehabbing a unit or something. Our federal funding is limited to serving people at 80% of area median income. And so, I wrote that down. So 80%, I think that's like 71,000 for a family of four. Um, so I would say that's workforce. Some, some people, I think the county's definition of workforce housing and the workforce housing part of the zoning code goes up to 120% of area median income. Is that right, Lynn? Yeah, I'm saying yes. So, um, but then when we're talking about the very low income, like I said, 
that's 30% of area median income. That's people making, you know, that would be a household of four making 28,000. A household of one, it would be even lower than that, somewhere around 21,000. So, yes, sir. I have um, two um, questions for you. The first one is, as we see different um, age demographics vary through um, time, through your experience, currently have you seen a big shift in the need from one age group to another that you guys have had challenges to address? Then I'll ask my second question. Okay, um, yeah, that's a good question. In our last con plan, we didn't, um, we used a lot of data that was provided by HUD and the census. And, you know, there's a growing elderly population, so that's, of course, something that we continue um, to support is housing, our rehab program for them. And in the past, we, you know, it's been, like I was saying, it's very difficult for developers to get available land, and also there's been community opposition to affordable housing. So the easiest properties to support were always elderly. They were, they, were, they were always getting elderly projects through. So we funded a lot of projects serving the elderly. Um, and that's why I think the state, when I talked about the opportunity map, um, the state really <coughs> said, well, hey, we gotta do something about this because all we're doing is getting these elderly projects. And so they kind of put those incentives on their, their funding process so that more family projects would come in. And so we've had such a, there's been such an imbalance we're trying to catch up with some family units, but I think there's still a need for senior. But um, with this, the consultant that we're having come on and the, the market analysis that he's going to do, I hope that gives us a much deeper dive into that data and okay. it'll shed some light on things. And also, at a um, very macro level, I see the wide range of services um, you guys offer. But um, has there been a consistent theme that keeps you up late at night? And besides, I know funding is going to always be a challenge, but is there one particular theme that you? Well, I one particular. I mean, one particular theme. We're here to serve the low-income community in Anne Arundel County. Whether it be with, I would say our first priority is affordable housing, and second priority is community services and, and revitalization services. And so, in addition to lack of funding, I think. It's, you know, one huge thing has been lack of community support for affordable housing to go into those communities. Thank you. So, do you want me to call on people? Yes, please. Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. I think you, Karen, and then this gentleman, and then you. <laughs> um, so, you have spoke about, I have two questions, but they're easy, they should be. <laughs> um, you have spoke about um, vouchers for um, low-income renters. Mm -hmm. um, is there a program in place um, for uh, low-income homeowners um, to also be able to maintain not just in the crisis of a foreclosure but um, through some voucher program as well I'm sure you know there's so we so the property rehabilitation program did I forget to mention I think I, I yeah I just yeah. skimmed over that so yeah we have a property rehabilitation program and but that's through like a loan program it is a loan. we don't have a grant program actually I take that back. We do have a smaller grant program. Um, it's not even. It's not a grant program. It's but it's more forgivable. I believe the terms on that are more favorable. Like it's it's smaller and um, it, it may be forgiven faster. But um, don't quote me on that. I got to check on what the requirements. But you know, this is federal funding, that, so we're going to put a lien on people's properties so that. We make, the whole point is to make sure that it remains affordable. It's not like a free giveaway. Right, right. Uh, but the terms are very favorable. It's a z even for our loan program. It's zero interest, zero payments. Um, defer it's deferred, um, depending on the income level and the affordability. If someone's making a lot of money and they don't have an, a lot of debt and they can afford to make payments, there may be a payment. Um, but they have to still make under the income threshold for the federal requirements. That, now there is one thing that we're looking at, and I think the um, county executive is included in this budget, the, sex, the accessibility modifications program I mentioned. Um, that currently is just for homeowners, but we are going to get some county funds that we're going to make a grant for renters who need small accessibility modifications in their rental units, and that will be provided as a grant if the county council approves that as part of the budget. And um, it, it can't pay for anything the landlord should already be paying for, but it would be extra things that they need to get around. 
So I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I forget your name. Uh, Pat. Yeah, Pat. The, this time. How do you screen, or do you screen for citizenship? For citizenship, in other words, <coughs> if people come in as they are coming over the borders now and finding their way to this area. How do you screen when you provide funding for citizens versus um, we have a federal, we have like a federal eligibility checklist and we screen for a whole host of different things including, you know, we took, we look at bank accounts, um, you know, at everything, especially if it's for our loan programs. Um, we have to take, do a whole financial accounting and look at everything, social security number, all that. So we do a thorough screening of everything. Yes, yeah, sorry, sir. Okay. I don't um, see people's names. I'm trying to make sure I'm clear on, on which programs are which. Is it priority revitalization communities part of what you're doing? Yeah, so that's what we called it in our last consolidated plan. So my oh. MACUS called that. Um, but those were all the low income areas where we can use some of our revitalization dollars. Um, we may call it something else in the next plan. I'm thinking it would be good to call it what Lynn's calling it, which would be our sustainable communities to be mm -hmm. consistent with um, what the county has applied for. But as you can see, those areas are kind of clustered around the same the same areas that Lynn was talking about. How, how many are there right now? How many? Uh, I don't. That's. A, I don't know how many census tracts were included in that. Okay. Um, I don't know, but I will tell you in practice, we are only because our funds that we found. So last time, what we did was we said in the past we just had like three revitalization areas, similar to what Lynn described. The last time we said, well, maybe we need to open it up. Maybe there's a community that might need this funding and we just don't know about them. So let's open it up and anybody, any community that's considered low mod by HUD, and, and those were all the colored ones on there, can be considered a priority revitalization community. Well, first we didn't have a lot of people come in, but the couple we did, we just have such little funding, it didn't make sense to spread it. We don't know that it makes sense to spread it. So we're considering going back to the old model, which is where we follow what Lynn was saying. So it would okay. just be Brooklyn Park, Severn, and Glen Burnie. Okay. So I'm sorry, this this lady. <coughs> I was just looking up, so I'm, I'm only the credit architect. So when you say sustainable communities, to me, that means something very different, I think, than what uh, the county is saying in, yeah. in that program and in this program. So I think that's just something to consider um, on a national level, that means something different. Um, sustainable sites, sustainable communities, sustainable cities. That's that's a, an environmental term for us, I think, more so than a longevity term. Um, I know, yeah, revitalization. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I will say, we didn't choose that term. That's that's a name that came down, again, from the state. That And so they, they said, if you want to be <laughs> eligible for all these different pots of state funding, you need to designate what your sustainable community so yeah, maybe we could call it something different. Or, or something maybe that. maybe they integrate some sustainable practices into that. Well, and, and, we, and make it a yeah. sustainable. And and we do actually. One thing I didn't get into is um, we administer. We we were the first agency to take advantage of the um, energy efficiency block grant funds back during the ARA times um, for the county because the county doesn't have a sustainability office. And so we said, hey, these are great funds. So we went in and got some of those fundings and did projects um, and a whole bunch of different projects throughout the county, but also um, got all of our um, housing um, construction guys certified in the BPI, um, and, and so they integrate the energy efficiency things into our bill. But we're, I mean, in addition to funding our partners who actually provide the public services or the vouchers or the housing themselves, we're very, um, and then in addition to the home ownership counseling that we provide, we're very construction oriented. So everything that we do it has an eye to the side. Yeah, if a, um, if a nonprofit <coughs> were interested in having a conversation about participating in our program and so forth, who in your office would they call to explore available grants? Um, you can call me, I'll give you my card. Um, I administer the local development council, council grants. Um, and then I oversee the administration of a lot of the CDBG grants, so it just depends. And I can, if it's not me, then I can direct you. Okay, and do you, do you have funding sources aside from the county and the and no. government organizations? Do you no. do your own? So you, you're a nonprofit, but you don't do any fundraising? Um, we, 
we go after competitive, mostly competitive state, state grants. Um, we do, we have done some private fundraising for some things, but we found that it's kind of a conflict. You know, we have a lot of subrecipients. We don't want to be competing with them for, you know, we don't want to be competing with Lighthouse or Sarah's house as they're, you know, doing their fundraiser to, to help the homeless when we're also administering the funds to them because um, it would be kind of duplicitous. But it depends on what it is. We do, we've done some private fundraising. Um, we've also um, received some competitive community investment tax credit funds and do fundra private fundraising to support that, to support a couple of different things. We have one more question and then we're going to take a break. Yeah, a quick uh, clarification on Pat's question. Um, so there are federal programs out there that do help illegals. Is being legal a deterrent to the county assistant with any of these projects? Um, we don't screen people in terms of what, th if they come in to our, like our financial literacy program, um, so they could come in, anybody can really come in for that if they're attending a class. Right. But we don't, we're not, we're not doing things where we're helping people get citizenship or no, helping no, them get the services. Housing, the, 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 the housing, the well, the well, rules, things of that nature. Is that, you said that there was federal, federal guidelines. Federal guidelines. Mm -hmm. So is that a deterrent to them or is it help them get into that housing? If they're, if they're here legally? Yes. Um, no. I, as far as I know, all the programs that the Housing Commission mm -hmm. administers, and we don't really do it, we don't have a, we don't directly administer these funds, um, but all of our partners, I, as far as I know, they have to have legal residency. Some form of legal documentation. Okay. I, I could be wrong, I'll double check on that. Um, okay. Thank you, Erin. We appreciate okay. it. And she will be here to take more questions. And we have a 10 minute break.
uh, entrance into the shopping center. They knocked down the bowling alley. They relocated uh, the gas station. They rebuilt uh, a new, new, beautiful looking giant at some pad sites. So those are another success as well. Um, another uh, service that we have in our office is the Small Business Development Center. Um, so we get companies that come to us all the time, uh, even if they're not companies yet, but they come to us and say, hey, I have this great idea for a business. Um, I don't really have a business plan. I don't really have any money. Um, what can you do for me? So um, this is a great program to, um, to send them to. We have one of the best small business counselors in the state um, to help with a business plan, to help to um, you know, get ready to get financing. Um, and that's a really good free resource, free resource for um, companies that are looking to, to start up. Another service that we provide is site selection. So prior to my life at Economic Development, I was a commercial real estate sales and sales and leasing. Um, so this is a service that we still provide um, if you're looking for a new location or if you're a new business looking to set up shop somewhere, um, we can help identify some properties for you based on your criteria and of course connect you to real estate professionals that can also help you. Other services, um, permitting and development assistance. I spend a lot of time uh, helping companies that uh, maybe they build out their space and they're struggling with permits or they uh, want to build a new building, uh, working with uh, the different county agencies to make sure that their project gets built, uh, built quickly. Uh, it's a coincidence that this one's on there. I know at least one person in the audience will notice that site plan uh, that was not intentional. Uh, another uh, good program that we have is our workforce training grant program. So when we're out and we're meeting with businesses every day, the biggest um, biggest issue for them is workforce, uh, workforce recruitment and also workforce training. It's tough uh, with the, with the um, employment rate being so low, there's not a lot of people out there looking for jobs, so it's, it's been tough for people to find qualified uh, employees. So this is a program that will reimburse uh, percentage, uh, up to 60% if they use the community college as their vendor, um, reimburse the, the cost for training employees. So if there's an employee out there um, that you think is a great candidate, that is lacking one skill, um, Hopefully this program can help offset some of the cost to train them. You can also use it for, uh, for current employees if, uh, if it results in them getting a raise or them getting a promotion. Uh, we see a lot of companies take advantage of this program. Runway to Success is one of our newer programs. Uh, a while back, Southwest came to us and said that they wanted to partner with us in some way, some way to help the business community, and uh, this is a program that we came up with. Um, any companies that are traveling uh, out of the state to um, conferences or, or to, um, to visit clients or to get sales. Um, we have Southwest has given us um, a few vouchers uh, to help again offset the cost of, of some of this business travel. Another um, department in our organization uh, is the marketing and research department. They are constantly looking at economic indicators. They're constantly um, looking at demographics and putting out different lists, whether it be an expanding list, which is always a popular list that people like to receive of, of uh, new companies or, or companies that are out there um, and growing and expanding. Um, we also do customized reports. Um, if somebody wants to, if they're considering moving uh, to a different location, they want to compare, say, the Annapolis market to the Glenbury market, or um, if they want to compare uh, the Hanover market to the Columbia market, um, we can provide customized demographics based on what they're looking for. Uh, also, we, we, we partner uh, very well with the state of Maryland, uh, Maryland Department of Commerce. They have somebody who's dedicated just to Anne Arundel County um, to promote their programs and resources. So whenever we're, we go out to meet with a company, uh, we always bring uh, Department of Commerce with us. They have a lot of different programs. Some of the more, I won't go through every one of them, but um, some of the more popular ones are the Job Creation Tax Credit. If you're gonna um, be hiring a lot of people in over a two year period, you can get uh, tax credits. Uh, more jobs for mailers, for manufacturers. We've seen that one uh, take advantage of um, quite a bit lately. Um, again, that's another, uh, it's not a tax credit, it's a cash incentive. Um, they have some workforce training programs as well to offset ours. And um, the MEDAC program is, is a good one that we've taken advantage of um, too in the last couple months. This is a forgivable loan. Basically, the company says, hey, we're gonna come in and we're gonna hire 200, uh, we're gonna hire 200, we're gonna create 200 new jobs, and we're gonna uh, invest you know, $5 million into this building. 
um, if they do that after a period of time, the loan is forgiven, and that's a state program. Some of the recent successes on here, um, those of you who have seen this presentation before, Paragon was on here. They've actually been in the news quite a bit lately. These numbers um, actually need to be updated. This was the initial deal that came in from uh, the uh, Maryland Biopark out of Baltimore City. They found a uh, location by the airport. It was about 150,000 square foot facility. They came to us and said we're going to create 200 jobs. Uh, we're going to invest about 400, 45 million dollars into the facility, which was which was a great investment. Um, they actually came back to us a, a short time later and said we actually need to take the building that's next to it as well. And um, the landlords are working on relocating some of the other tenants in there. So they're going to double their size. They're actually going to have 400 jobs in Interim County, um, 500 in the state. Um, and they're probably going to double that, that capital investment. Uh, this company was in the paper recently for being acquired uh, for about $1.2 billion. So we've seen a lot of uh, Paragon in the, in the news lately. And it's definitely a quickly growing company. Best Buy is a deal, a deal that's near and deal near and dear to my heart. Um, five years ago, we lost out on this. Uh, I was chasing them to come locate here. It's a distribution facility for them. Uh, they ended up uh, locating in Howard County. Five years later, the lease ran up and we were able to, uh, to get them to move here into a brand new facility up in uh, Brandon Woods Business Park. Um, 200 new jobs and again, a big capex. Hmm. Amazon, not HQ2, uh, but again, it's a distribution facility with a good number of jobs. And uh, home builders, we saw two big home builders relocate their corporate headquarters um, to the county, one in Annapolis and one in, um, in Walt Chapel. High Tech Colors, manufacturer in Odenton, um, that expanded their facility, uh, $20 million capex, and uh, in addition to a few jobs as well. To your point, is the data center up by the airport in Lincecum. And that is it. Yes. 
I know that a few years back that uh, your organization was involved in a lot of the problems that these companies have with getting permits for a lot of stuff. Uh, how, how much of a percentage of the work that you do is involved with helping them go through that maze of problems that occurs with the permit department? Yeah, so that's really, in the office, that's really my responsibility to do that. So I'm constantly working with companies um, that are, you know, it could be something as simple as, um, you know, just, just building out their space and, 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 you know, putting up a couple walls. Um, there's certainly some more complicated issues, but I certainly spend a lot of time doing that. Yeah. And we have a good relationship with the uh, specialists and permits. But the vast majority of the small businesses complain about that problem. They do. I mean, because, you know, they're small businesses. You know, they, they know what their business is. You know, they don't know how to get a permit. They don't know, you know, architecture and, and the, the ins and the outs. So that's sort of where we come in and, and try to make that process a little bit easier for them. Okay. You should know that name. Yes. Was Jerry Walker supposed to be this one? He had another idea. Um, Jerry is our new uh, president and CEO. He's uh, about three months on the job, so he gave a similar presentation uh, this morning to a group, but uh, had to have the yeah. I didn't know that his uh, absence was moving. Uh, <laughs> Indeed. I will pass Second along that out. message. One more. I, I'm just curious, uh, that Aragon story, it's a great <clears throat> success. Um, what are the things about Anne Arundel County that attracted that specific business to Anne Arundel? Yeah, so in that location. a few things. I think um, the, the first is being so close to the, to the airport. Um, a lot of our clients, they're a contract manufacturer for um, for pharmaceuticals and for, you know, I can't even uh, begin to try to understand exactly everything that they're doing, but they're basically a contract manufacturer for pharmaceuticals. So a lot of their clients are up in the, um, the Massachusetts area. So to be um, so close to the airport was very important to them. Um, also, you know, they sort of grew out of their space in the bio park. They were sort of uh, fragmented throughout the park. In bio park? Uh, in Baltimore City. Okay. So to have a, um, a big facility, you know, two big facilities, to, to give them the space that they needed to grow was a big thing. You know, we're, we're very lucky, very fortunate to be, uh, to, to have the county um, have these big assets of Fort Meade, um, the airport, um, city government, uh, everything going on at Ronald Mills. Um, we're very fortunate to have those assets. What is your reporting structure for the county? Um, good question. So I am a, um, an employee of the corporation. Our president and CEO is a county employee who's appointed by the county executive. Yes? When you create jobs using a percent, let's say you have 100 jobs, how many of those are um, people who are living in the county now versus who will be attracted county as um, additional population? Yeah, good question. Um, we used to have a graphic that showed the, um, the amount of people who, uh, who, who lived in the county and worked in the county, and vice versa, uh, how many people lived outside the county and commuted in. Um, I don't know if, if we updated that in some time, but it was an interesting. What would be your ballpark sense? I would say that the majority, um, again, it depends on what company we're talking about, but um, I would say that the majority lived in the county. But there is a good amount that come in from outside the county, from, from uh, Eastern Shore, um, or some of the, the neighboring jurisdictions to the north. And then when you attract these companies, do you, are there incentives, or is this a net gain to the tax base? Um, it depends. Again, it depends on the company. Um, I would say the incentives that have the most bang are definitely the state incentives. Some of the tax credits that we talked about, um, you know, the, the companies that are going to be employing these companies, high, high number of jobs. Um, definitely the state incentives are, are, uh, are more attractive than, than what we provide. You know, we provide financing you know, for companies that, that can't get financing. For some of these bigger companies, that's not really, that doesn't really move the needle. Um, the workforce training. Uh, I mean, once they're here, are they a net gain to, to the tax base? Yes. Okay, yes. okay. we, um, Wes will be available maybe a few more minutes afterwards, but we need to continue. Thank you very much. And you'll we'll begin to that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Hager has a few words that he would like to say to us before Ms. Schneider is next. Good evening. I was asked to recap my comments from our last meeting. I'll be very quick. 
Um, this is just to kind of help encapsulate and put things in a better perspective for you as you continue this process of listening to the background reports. Um, you're going to hear a lot of information and you're, you've already heard a lot. You've taken in a lot of information and, and it may be that you're concerned about all of that. There's no test. There, there is no test, okay? Um, what we're trying to do with all of this is to put you in a better place to be reviewing documents that, we're that are going to be coming your way that will make up the elements of what will become the plan, okay? So this is truly background information. It's just designed to put you in a better place, give you an opportunity to get, get some good general knowledge, and to whet your appetite for things that maybe you have a desire to get greater knowledge on. By doing this and having the, the experts come and talk to you, now you know who you need to speak with if you are interested in getting greater specificity or additional knowledge on a given topic, okay? All of you, you're a very unique group of people. And many of you possess certain expertise in many areas, but probably most of you don't have expertise in every area that's part of what is going to become our general development plan. So it is important that you have some knowledge of all areas, and that's what our goal is here today, so that when staff presents you with elements for your review and comment, you're going to have the requisite knowledge you need to adequately and appropriately review it, or at least know who to ask questions of. So the other thing that's really important to keep in mind is that all of these things have to do with a lot of different areas, okay? When it really comes down to it, the, the preponderance of what we're going to be wrestling with and dealing with in the general development plan are the things dealing with these topic areas that have to do also with land use. Okay? So while some of these things present some real dilemmas and some societal issues and some things that really need to be, to be solved, it's not within our purview, it's not within our province to solve all of them, even though we would like to. Okay? So it's important to keep that in context that it has to do with the land use piece of it that we're focused on, okay? So as you look at tonight, we talk about revitalization, we talk about economic development. How does that relate to land use and the, and the, and the goals and objectives that we're gonna have in our plan? We talked a lot last time about public safety issues. What do some of those things, okay, we talked about manpower, staffing issues, and a lot of other things. Are they land use issues or what about the public safety presentation had to do with land use? Like, do they need a new station? Does there enough land for this? Are we growing at a rate that, uh, that is exceeding our ability to provide adequate protection? These kinds of things. So just kind of try to keep some of those things in perspective. And just wanted to help you with that a little bit. A couple of you were saying, man, we're getting so much information. I'm not sure how, how to catalog it all or how to use it all. So hopefully this helps. And uh, I'm going to shut up now because we still got some other specialist to hear from. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. So next is Ms. Jennifer Schneider, who's the Deputy <coughs> Director of the Bureau of Disease Prevention and Management as part of the Department of Health. Safety is, is created. 
Um, so the built environment can have a direct impact on public health issues, including water quality, um, and we're going to talk about some of these. Um, water quality, adult and childhood obesity, inactivity, cancer, and respiratory problems. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the Department of Health. Um, the Department of Health is, or they don't have kind of Department of Health, is a local health department for our county, and is a division of the Maryland Department of Health. Um, the, our department serves over 568,000 residents and has been serving the health needs of the community since 1930. The department has nearly 700 diverse employees, um, which include doctor or physicians, nurses, social workers, um, dietitians, nutritionists, allied health professionals. We, we, have, we have it all. Um, and we all work together towards the department's um, mission, which is to preserve, promote, and protect the health of all in Arundel, all people who live, work, and play in Anne Arundel County. So um, the DOH is held accountable for enforcing certain federal, federal, state, and um, county laws in addition to regulations, guidelines, and standards of care. Um, and so in addition to the regulatory and enforcement work that we do, we also um, provide directly, we provide mandated, delegated, and local, locally initiated public health services. So all these services um, that I just spoke about fall under five um, bureaus. So we have the Bureau of Behavioral Health, Disease Prevention and Management, um, the Bureau of Environmental Health, Family Health Services, and School Health Services. So those are our main bureaus. I'm not going to go into um, details about that. Uh, but if you have any questions, I can certainly um, help help with those. So as you can see from this map, um, we have locations all throughout the county. Our main headquarters is here in Annapolis, right on um, Perry Instrument Parkway, um, and we also operate 11 sites throughout throughout the county. Um, in addition, we have staff um, that work in the over 125 public schools. We have staff in the court system and to the two detention facilities that are in the county. Um, and some of these county, some of these facilities are county owned as well as um, some of our leased. So um, just a brief overview of our challenges and future needs. Um, so of course, you know, our first challenge is the decrease or elimination of funding paralleled with our increased demand for services. Um, and also, especially in the Bureau of Disease Prevention and Management, we deal with current or emerging, emerging health priorities, which are significant, complex, and underfunded. So this could be um, the Zika virus disease or Ebola virus. Um, so the Departments of Health priorities that were included in this background report um, are the opioid epidemic, recreational waters, and the food environment. And Anne's gonna be talking about the food environment, but I'm gonna start with the um, opioid epidemic. So as you all may know, we, there's a little rise in the mental health and substance use issues, and we're finding that there's a lack of appropriate services and service providers located throughout the county. So um, the, this, the impact of opioid use disorders continues to be a top priority for the department. And it's not just in the Bureau of, the, the Bureau of, Disease, or the Bureau of Behavioral Health. It's where all, all of us are working together to try to um, have an impact on this, um, this challenge. Um, so just really briefly, and these numbers were just as of April 2nd, um, our department puts out every week um, an update of these numbers. But as of April 2nd, there have been a total of 213 total overdoses in 2019, which is actually a 24.2% decrease since um, from 281 overdoses in 2018, year to date. Um, 35 of these overdoses were fatal, which is also a decrease of 32.7% from the 52 fatal overdoses year to date in 2018. The substance of choice is still fentanyl, um, which is accounting for 34% of all the fatal overdoses. Um, and so the department's long-term planning goals are to continue to develop a, a robust behavioral health system and this will include the goals of decreasing the morbidity and mortality associated with behavioral health conditions and increasing the number of individuals in long-term recovery by establishing care coordination systems for treatment and recovery from substance use or co occurring disorders. And our behavioral health um, bureau works very closely with the community and our the Anne Roman County Mental Health Agency 
to um, work on these goals. So the recreational um, waters is another very important priority moving forward because we need to take care of the, 500, the over 534 miles of linear coastline that county residents and visitors enjoy for recreational use. So from Memorial Day to Labor Day, the Department of Health takes samples from over 80 county beaches where people swim or engage in activities that may result in ingestion of these waters. So the water is tested for bacteria that comes from the intestines of all warm-blooded animals. Um, and then based on the level of bacteria, the um, indicates the, the um, water quality trends in the recreational use. And the department monitors that and put postings out to um, and alerts to let residents and visitors know that um, the water may be safe uh, or unsafe to um, be in. So development in any watersheds can bring the potential for storm water that can bring risk to our beaches and waterways, such as dog waste, septic, or pu public sewer systems. So the Department of Health um, has a grant, um, a program called the Bay Restoration Program, where they um, approve nitrogen-reducing treatment systems on any new septic, sy septic system installed in any critical area. Uh, we provide funding for we provide funding so that people, that residents can actually switch from private well to county well and um, more um, environmentally friendly septic systems. Um, so funding for this program comes from a grant administered through the Maryland Department of Health um, from the Environmental Protection Agency. So as budgets continue <coughs> to decline, um, the elimination of this program could potentially impact the residents and create some additional health risks. Um, so it's really important for us to um, continue this program. So that's all with um, our first two priorities. And now I'm going to turn it over to Ann, who's going to spotlight our food environment. Um, and this, like I said, this is more of a spotlight because we really feel that um, the general development plan could really have an impact on the food environment within Ann Arbor. Um, 
And if you are, for example, overweight or obese, you are at increased risk of a lot of other things, including cancer, stroke, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure, sleep disorders, and respiratory problems. So sort of the gamut. Yeah. And what we wanted to do first when we started looking at this is we really wanted to see well, what does the food environment look like in Anne Arundel County? So we've been tracking this for uh, several years, which brings us to this map. So that's why I wanted to provide you sort of a bigger version. I we can just talk about it for a second. I just want to orientate you to what you're seeing. So for example, you'll see the areas in yellow are the areas where the, um, the households and staff is greater than the county average. So it's this high concentration. And I wanted to point something out that um, Aaron earlier was talking about cost burdens. And so I wanted to just bring up that um, if you're a SNAP recipient or a food stamp right, recipient, you're, the median annual income of households receiving SNAP benefits in our county is 33,000. So it's very low. Um, and comparing that with the county average being close to 90,000. So I just wanted to point that out because uh, Aaron earlier was talking about cost burdens. And these are some of the, the metrics a lot of us share. You know, what your income is for the household really affects a lot of different things, including your ability to qualify for federal nutrition benefits, including SNAP and WIC, and then also your ability to um, afford a lot of other things. And then I also wanted to point out this food desert. Um, the slash areas, and you can't really see it, but there is um, some slashing here, um, here, and of course in North County. Um, and then we wanted to show you um, maybe what some programs are, so overlay some existing programs. Go ahead, sorry. Can you explain SNAP and WIC? I'm not sure everybody knows what the acronym is for. Oh, sorry, <coughs> SNAP, like food stamps. And WIC is another federal nutrition benefit. So if your family qualifies for that, you get um, money, supplemental money for food. Thank you. Is that a good? Yep. Sorry, women, infants, and children. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I define food environment, but yes. Yeah, so, so there are those ones, no. um, other acronyms <clears throat> that we're so familiar with, and I apologize about that. SNAP um, stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. <laughs> yes. So sometimes we know them so well we forget what they stand for, but I'm thankful that I remember this. So, um, so I just wanted to, on this map, we wanted to overlay it with some things that are going on that address some of these issues. So I want you to notice that the schoolhouses, this is where um, there are programs that the schools are doing. Because this, these are areas of need, it qualifies uh, those schools because if they're greater than 50%. Um, uh, students that are eligible for free and reduced meals. So those schools have summer programs and dinner programs and all different kinds of programs that they run to help address that need. So you're really noticing probably that there's an overlap in services, which is great. Okay. And we also wanted to look at another access point for, um, for food access, which is farmer's markets. And you'll notice that um, there's not we don't have too many, and it does shift year to year with where they're located or how many we have. Um, but we have the Warren Shop, which is the farmer's markets that exist that don't accept all federal nutrition benefits, including food stamps, including um, women, infants, and children, or WIC, um, or the Farmer's Market Nutrition Program, which is offered to qualifying seniors and WIC participants. It's a temporary, like it's, it's a, summer program or a market season program. So if they don't accept those, uh, all of those, then they're yellow. And then there's two, one at A, Anne Arundel Medical Center, and one at Brooklyn Park Middle School. It's really hard to see, so that's what I want to point out. Those accept all the federal nutrition benefits. And it's, the reason why we point that out is that if we're going to, if we have programs that are available, we want to make sure that our residents in our county, if they're accessing um, places that have healthy fruits and vegetables from our farmers, we want people to be able to use those benefits to purchase those and then make them more eligible for matching programs and other things. 
So why don't they? Is it the individual <coughs> vendors can't accept that, or the management has said that they will not be eligible, or why can't, if I'm selling my tomatoes, why can't I accept those programs? So it's, it is up to the individual farmer and the market level management. So Wes, is he still here? Yeah. Um, so Anne Arundel Economic Development Corporation runs some of these markets. So they would be better of a, um, okay. able to answer that question. But we, we think everybody should. That's one of our goals is to really ensure that every market, because that's going to benefit our economics in our county. It's going to benefit our health. It's going to benefit our our producers, our farmers. So it's a really important measure. Just to be a devil's advocate here, if you're a farmer and you're accepting a SNAP coupon, yes, how are you going to get paid? How do you, you have to go someplace and get that get reimbursed? Get you, the money, or you do get reimbursed? Yes, you do. And so, why why <clears throat> do they do that? Why? I mean, people can still go to a grocery store and buy fresh fruits and vegetables. Absolutely. And they accept the SNAP. Yes, ma'am. So, <coughs> so I guess I'm just saying I don't understand why why somebody wouldn't go to a grocery store instead of putting that on a farmer to have to take care of going through the hoops that it takes to get their money because that's a good question. So, I think in everything that we do, what we're trying to do is make sure that if there's a program available, we want to take advantage of it. <coughs> we want to make sure that all those good things that are happening in Baltimore City that we see those dollars being spent. We want those dollars to also go towards our local farmers, right? That's going right back locally. But then um, the question asked, you can spend it there, but not everybody can get to a grocery store. From So from our perspective, farmers markets are creating access points that create opportunity for those who may not have the economic resources to travel certain distances to get to it. And that's why federal nutrition benefits are accepted. They've gone through the trouble of making sure people that have WIC can go there and use those benefits there, not just at a grocery store. And also, are the prices, you know, is there a price difference at all? So it can, it can go either way. It depends on the jurisdiction. I have a question. Uh, uh, why is corn bean in a desert? Yeah. Is so there a lack of data? Or is it <coughs> no, sir, it's not a lack of data. So food deserts are defined by the USDA. And so it's a formula that you can plug in based on, um, and if you if you like the formula, it actually used to be at the county can There's a bunch of stuff at the There's, um, well, this isn't the whole formula, but it's set by the USDA, um, and it's uh, presented as low income and low access measured at half a mile and 10 miles, uh, respectively. So there is, our epidemiologists helped us map this out, and much like a lot of the other maps that you'll see, it's based on the available data, yeah, not lab data. Sorry. Yeah, they, they have a lot of the <laughs> So it might be the surrounding, the surrounding the area. Yeah, so actually. it's like Pioneer City, or so well, in urban Pioneer City. Fair Oaks has a big it's shopping center there. there. Yeah. So if you yes. look at, I, I know specifically a lot about Brooklyn Park. So Brooklyn Park is a four square mile area. They do have a grocery store. It's actually closing, but um, that that seems pretty close, right? I mean, if you if it's in your area, but if you can if you don't have transportation, if you don't have good bus access, half a mile is a very long way. Especially if it takes you two hours to reach that destination, which is what we're doing. Especially two with our WIC offices. They're right down the street. But it takes residents two hours to get there. I don't have an extra two hours in my day. So this is just part of a big picture of what makes a, a access really important and really important to understand. Yes, uh, with regard to community schools, other counties have community schools where they incorporate grocery stores, health services, mental health services within <coughs> the school itself. It depends on where, what the community needs. Do we have any in Anne Arundel County? You mentioned Brooklyn Park area. Are there others? So um, we do not have any school-based health centers um, in the way that Baltimore City does and maybe some other surrounding. However, our um, school health nurses 
have um, they have programs in the schools now, especially for mental health, they're really expanding those services. Um, so right now they have the STAR program, um, which is a new program within the past couple of months, and I and I don't know um, what that stands for, but I know that it's if people, if a student, and it's only in the high schools right now, if the student presents with a mental health issue, they're immediately connected via iPad, <coughs> via iPad with a clinician, and so they're able to um, get into um, get into care faster right there. Um, and then they also have naloxone. Um, all school health centers have naloxone, um, which or Narcan, or, or Narcan. So just in case somebody was o overdosing in the school, they can provide that. And I'm, um, I feel like there's a third one. Do you know Becky? So we don't. While we don't have clinicians like nurse practitioners on site, um, we have the mental health piece covered. Um, and we're, you know, we're expanding those services. And then also um, our health centers, we have a few community health centers that um, provide clinical services still. And so if there's a, uh, like immunizations, which is a huge one, um, the immunizations for children in order for them to attend school um, are provided um, free or low cost um, at our health centers, or two, two main health centers, the Murray Health Center and Full Health Center. So, does that answer your question? Yes, we did, thank you. Um, with that being said too, we are, like you see in this map, we are trying to overlap things of where people are, however. Yes. Um, we have the farmer's market that is up there, is in the parking lot of um, Brooklyn Park Middle School, and a new, uh, another food access point is a healthy food pantry that we have on the same complex in the rec center, which is part of the same um, uh, campus and building. And then also, I don't know if you know that um, the same location is uh, the Chesapeake Arts Center, also the Senior Center, which is getting a major renovation. And also we have one of our sites, one of our health department sites is on the same campus, but not part of the same physical build. So that's kind of something that you're talking about, sort of this overlap in where people are. Right. Is, is your program tied into any of the Title I schools around the area where they really have a problem with after school uh, food? I know my Rotary Club gets involved with that uh, in terms of providing food. Oh, okay. So are any of these schoolhouses also Title I? Yeah. So the qualification to have a schoolhouse is that it's the, pop, the um, overall school um, attendance is greater than 50% uh, uh, students that are eligible for free reduced price meals, so that's an income based. And so you're asking, is there overlap with Title One? And I imagine so, but I don't know what that overlap is. That would be a question for Anne Arundel County Public Schools, and they share their data with us all the time, which is obviously how we got the um, metrics here. Okay. And the Brooklyn Park um, Farmers Market and the Brooklyn Park um, Healthy Food Pantry, but especially the food pantry, is like a couple of months. It's like pilot. So we are hoping that at some point we can um, move into other areas that um, that are in need as well. Um, and Anne is really good at um, being in the community and making those connections. So it's not only the Department of Health that is providing healthy food for the food pantry. But right now, up in Brooklyn Park, um, she's creating a system where she partnered that she partnered with um, a church that's up there. So now they're part of our. Um, I guess our, our partnership, yeah, team, um, and they're providing food to their community. And then there's also other food pantries throughout um, the county, and Anne has been involved in kind of creating a, um, a healthy food pantry policy so that the food that's um, given out to families in need is um, has you, certain nutritional benefits. Are you tied to Anne Arundel Food Bank as well? Yes. And the Maryland Food Bank, so okay. we have partnerships with both of them. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. We've got the wrap it up sign. Oh, so I have questions though. So, yes. Um, I, don't know. I, I don't know what to do, so I'm referring to the chair. Oh, you want I'm sorry. To wrap it up Two questions. questions. It's a compliment. Not okay. A compliment. Yeah. I, I just wanted yeah, to compliment. I'm finished. Finish. <laughs> okay. I wanted to compliment you guys on the progress you made on the opioids. 
got a lot of vacant lots totally run down and they built, uh, <coughs> built uh, community gardens and it, it looked like it was very successful when we, when we zone properties here we have places for playgrounds should we have places allocated for a community garden so we do work a lot with the community gardens with the schools with um, uh, individual groups and parks and rec um, a lot of community gardens exist already in our county um, but there is opportunity for that type of development um, we did talk to lynn i think that was one of your questions when we were looking at the food policy scan and figuring out one could gardens be in certain spaces and also can um, animal husbandry be present in certain spaces and um, so i think that that type of work is something that we want to get really good at and partner with other agencies to see how we can fulfill those. Um, also, Greater Baybrook, which I heard come up a lot in um, Pat in the presentations earlier this evening, and they support and have grants for those types of things too. So I, there are a lot of organizations working on it, um, and I think that it's a, we do have spaces in Anne Arundel County that could benefit from those types of programs. Great, thank you very much. We appreciate that. We're going to keep going because we are almost out of time. The next one on the order of business, and hopefully all of you have read the minutes. There is one correction that the meeting, the next meeting is May 1st. Are there any other corrections? Do we have a motion to accept the minutes as corrected? So moved. Second? Thank you. All in favor? Thank you. Any attention? Anything else? Any other comments? No. Thank you. Okay. Other business, real quickly before we get into the other things. Bios. We still owe, some of you still have not turned in your bio. The bios need to be on this new form. If you turned in a bio before, you need to make sure you turn in a bio now. Six sentence limit. So, and they all are going to need to be the same because they are going to be public. So we don't want some people to have two pages and some people to follow the rules and have six sentences. One paragraph, a par approximately four to six sentences. Does anybody need a new form? I need a form. It's the same as what Cindy yeah. sent out. Right, I sent it out. Yeah. So yeah. we've we it done in. it. Yeah. That's great. Okay. We appreciate it. I just want to make sure that everybody knows because we need it to be consistent yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. and the same. So and four to six sentences. Right you can do it right now. That's awesome. But she probably would like to have it electronically done so that she can cut and paste and put it together because it is going to be posted on the website. Make sure this is information that you want public. Okay. Any other questions about the bios? We are doing name tags. If you would like to have your name tag other than what is printed on this sheet, for example, I've spoken to Patricia and she would prefer to have Pat. If you would like to have something other than what is on this sheet, please tell me by the time you leave today. Otherwise, it'll be as it is printed on this sheet that was sent out. Does anybody need a copy of that? Okay. Any other questions about name tags? We'll have them available for you next time that we meet. Okay. And now, am I back on track? I'm still behind. Okay. CAC, introductions and membership. And we will start with Amy over here. And we get two minutes, just like a county council. And I will time you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Um, all right, I'm Amy Leahy. I live in Serena Park. I'm a retired county employee, 20 years with Anne Arundel County, eight years budget office, nine years recreation parks, two years constituent services. That's about almost 20 years. Um, so my interest in serving on the CAC is that I have been very uh, involved with Greater Serena Park Council. I started going to meetings when I was actually in constituent services and then I just continued. I'm actually on board for Greater Suburban Park Council now, and I'm involved in some other community association groups too. Um, I just uh, I just feel like there's a lot of work that we need to do as citizens. There's a lot of citizen involvement that needs to occur. Um, is that enough? Perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Kate Bauer. I live in West River. Born in Anne Arundel County. Left when I was four. Came back when I was a lot older. 
I've been here for 25 years as of Saturday. Um, and spent 40 years in consulting in strategic planning and governance, working with not-for-profits, mostly scientific, business, um, and charitable organizations, nationally and internationally. I was drawn to this work because I've spent my life working on planning, and I know how important the results are of thinking carefully about where you want something to be. And I've been the beneficiary of the last plan because I live in South County and it looks a lot like it did when I moved in 25 years ago, which from my standpoint is pretty good. So I'm delighted to be part of this process. I'm Pat Booker and I live in Crofton and I moved to Crofton 52 years ago as one of the original settlers in Crofton. Um, I have seen a lot of development and I have not moved but in the last 10 or 15 years, I should have moved because the quality of life in Crofton has deteriorated for everyone. The schools are overcrowded, you can't get out on the streets. It's just terrible. And I really, you know, I look at Mayo and I look at some other places that are just starting to develop. And I really don't, Jessup, and I really don't want to see any more Croftons. You know, that's it. I don't know how I'm anxious to get to our community meeting because I have no idea, nor do my neighbors, how to fix this mess. So that's why I volunteered to be on the committee, and that's why I'm here. And I'm glad your last 20 years were better than mine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Charlie Marion. I live in Lincoln. I've been there 58 years. Um, I'm 64, so most of my life. Um, I was on the original BWI Small Area Plan Group that convened in 1999, 20 years ago. Um, so I was kind of drawn back to this process because I did that. Uh, my background is really accounting. I've been an auditor with the state of Maryland for 25 years and with that the county government for 15 years. So I know a lot about the county government. Um, I've audited and done the budget of just about every agency we've seen here so far. Um, so I was kind of, like I said, I was on the committee. I wanted to come back and see what was going on and I'd like to preserve the hometown feel of Lentigum, which after 58 years we still do have, um, as long as you kind of draw a circle around the community. And then BWI and the surrounding businesses, I, you know, they're an economic driver and I like to see them uh, prosper, but I still want to keep the character of our community. I'm John Clark, I'm from Pasadena. I'm a 15-year veteran of lectures from Park Rotary Club. That's where I started my community service. Uh, because of that, I got involved with the local chambers of commerce. And that actually allowed me to network throughout Glen Burnie, Pasadena. And frankly, our county executive asked me whether or not I would represent Pasadena, and I said yes. I'd love to know. <laughs> Um, I'm Karen Caravani. Um, I'm a 35-year uh, resident of Anne Arundel County. Um, went to schools here. Um, I'm currently raising five children um, in Anne Arundel County, and I basically my background is in community services. I'm a former EMT. I have a degree in human services as well, um, and I'm also, as mentioned before, on the uh, Greater Paper Alliance Steering Committee. So. Um, what they're trying to do. Um, I'm also on the Greater Brooklyn Park Council, which helps uh, North County residents to come together um, with the with, with the issues we need a big group to come together on um, for our part of the county. Um, and that's basically it. I enjoy doing these things, um, and I basically speak as a uh, representative of the community. Davis. Um, I'm an at-large uh, for the environment here. I'm on the Legal Conservation Voters Board, C4 Board. have been for a number of years since I moved uh, from Prince George's County about six years ago, um, and I moved my, my architectural company of 20 years uh, from Prince George's to here. Um, so I'm a leader accredited, as you, as you heard. Sustainability in my practice is all about um, a balance between the natural environment and the, and the built environment, and so uh, this 
comes very naturally for me to be interested um, because this is what I do and I know the importance of planning. Uh, so I'm here to advocate for the environment specifically um, and for smart growth um, as well. Uh, so my background, I was a WSSC commissioner uh, before I moved here. Um, so I have a, a good bit of knowledge and you know, familiar with that. That's the Washington Clear and Sanitary Commission and that's the water uh, for both Montgomery County and Prince George's County. And I was at Prince George's County appointee for that. So I have um, knowledge at that level of uh, infrastructure and uh, what it means to be a priority priority funded area, which is how NATO uh, partly ended up where we are right now and how we're fighting, why we're fighting so hard. I am on the steering committee of the neighbors of Mayo Peninsula as well. So. Thanks. I'm Gary Muller. I've, uh, I've lived in Jessup 68 years. And uh, like you guys were saying, I've, I've seen a lot of change. I'd like to see the, uh, the deers. We have a herd of about, about 12 deers and a little babies. We have foxes, rabbits, and, um, ground hogs, if you don't like them. Um, but uh, I, I work for a large aerospace company in, in, uh, in the Olympian area uh, as an engineer. Um, I've been involved in, in the land use and zoning uh, quite a bit. I, I, I started probably formally, I guess, with the uh, gentleman uh, Dave Bosher and uh, council member uh, uh, Ted Sobley years ago when, when they, I think it was the first time they did smaller plans. So we were doing that for a long time. I've been involved in just the Coon Association uh, 30 plus years. And uh, our main concern in just was keeping it as a family uh, oriented, a nice looking community as best we can. Um, things have gotten a little haywire. Things have gotten out of whack. You can drive through there. You can even say, did anybody do any planning in here? Is there any zoning going on? So we're trying our best to you know, to, to, at this point, to mitigate the problems that we've been dealt with and uh, to try to make sure going forward we can do the best we can. Uh, I've served as a, uh, a member of the Zoning Commission in Delaware, and I've served as a town commission in Delaware also. So we've been both in a community point of view and, and also as an um, elected official. So uh, I've, I've lived a lot of zoning. Matthew Corbelak, currently serving on the Odenton Town Center Advisory uh, Committee. I've been living in Odenton for a little over 22 years, raised our four kids there. And uh, commute on into D.C. all those years, working for the Federal Bureau of Prisons as an occupational safety professional. So I have uh, was also invited uh, by county uh, folks and said, okay. And uh, so I'm getting my feet wet. Uh, the Odenton Town Center Advisory Committee is kind of a, a you know, similar, but this is bigger scope. And when asked why, why, why are you doing this, I'm like, I'll figure that out. I, but the, the short answer is, I, I really want to give back to the community. I want to see good stuff happening for Odenton, definitely, and uh, and for Fulton County. I thoroughly enjoy the Chesapeake Bay uh, sailing boats of all sorts of shapes and sizes building a boat right now for uh, a retirement, uh, impending retirement. Of course, out of federal law enforcement for many years. So uh, I'm going to take a uh, one-year uh, trip on boat and designing the boat. Uh, my name is Anthony Brett. I think I'm new to the county. I've only been here for three years out on the Mayo Peninsula. Um, I was the first school that was president of the Neighbors of the Mayo Peninsula um, dealing with the uh, all the development out there that was going on. Um, uh, since then, I've stepped back and somebody else has taken that place and I was asked to do this, so I've done that. Um, I grew up on a mountain in Colorado. The closest person to me was a half a mile away. I want my boys to be able to ride their bikes to school in a safe manner, to have the water, the trees, and grow up in a nice community environment and 
be with the kids that they're with now for the rest of their life as their friends. I didn't have that growing up, so that's kind of my driving force behind what I'm, what I'm doing. So I want to have that that planned kind of a community feel to the to the county, and make sure that it's smart growth as we go forward. That it's we're working hand in hand with communities with the developers to focus and target what we want, where we want it, and that it doesn't overburden the developers financially to put things in, which forces them to, I think, uh, to do some of the things that they're trying to do to, you know, to survive the company. And if we can work together to alleviate some of that, some of that pain on both sides, I think that we can really do some smart things here in this county. Hi everybody, uh, my name is James <coughs> Frazier. Um, I've been a resident of uh, Anne Arundel, specifically Piney Orchard in Odenton, uh, for about 15 years. Uh, spent three years as chairman of the Oversight Committee in Odenton. Um, I was on the Planning Advisory Board for a year um, here. Um, after that, uh, I spent six years as president of the Old Oaks Association in Howard County. Um, so I know, you know a lot about Howard County, um, their general plan and all that other stuff. I haven't spent as much time in the last six years in Anne Arundel, uh, just because where my job goes. Um, uh, professionally, I am a, a civil engineer. I went to Bucknell, I got that undergrad degree in uh, engineering. Uh, after I got my engineering license, I went back to school, I got an MBA, a uh, master's in real estate finance. Um, I am extremely proud of development. Uh, I have no apology whatsoever. I know that there are negative consequences of development, but I think my role on this committee is to explain that it is not the greed of the developer that causes this, okay? I think what we all have to understand is planning sets the rules. Selling of the land, once it is planned, brings the development. I'm a part plan that if it's not me, it's going to be another guy. And we're going to follow the rules that we, we as a group are going to set. So if you don't like what happens because of the developers, you got to understand that it's not really our choice. Okay? We're told what we can do on a piece of land that we're buying. That is basically what it boils down to. And we have to compete with every other developer to buy any piece of land that we want to do. So, I am very proud of what I do. I take great pride in my work. Um, I do, I'm not discrediting the negative impact. I hate traffic, we all hate traffic, right? So let's make a better plan. Let's make a better set of rules. Let's understand the consequences of the changes. Let's not you know, try to build a wall and keep everybody out. That's not gonna work, right? We, we have real problems. We can build our way out of some of those. Some of, you know, so there's just options, there's ideas. I want to bring all that here. I am totally respectful of everybody's opinion uh, and hope that you'll be the same with me. And I look back to share some experience with you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pat Lynch and I'm a very proud environmentalist. <laughs> I have lived in Annapolis since 1965. I was born in New York City, went to Trinity College in Washington and Columbia University for graduate school. I taught school in New York, California, and Maryland for 12 years, and then was hired by the IBM Corporation. Worked for IBM for 28 years, and my responsibility throughout the entire time was state and local government management and compliance and uh, marketing. Um, I'm here because it's in my genes. I, I can't imagine not trying to preserve the environment not trying to keep the trees that are our infiltrators of choice and not trying to make Anne Arundel County a better place to live. I was the representative from the Broadneck Peninsula. I live in Amory, by the way, out near the Bay Bridge, and I was a representative in the old small area plan as well as the uh, general development plan. So I'm back. where I've lived for the last 60 years. Before that, I grew up in Baltimore County in Towson, and 
so I have some background in terms of the total, total area. Um, I have a lot of different interests, so I'm very eclectic, if you will, in the things that I am interested in. I've been on a number of national as well as state commissions and they're very diverse, diverse as the state racing commission, and in education, developing gifted and talented programs, performing gifted and talented programs for in our school systems. And so that's kind of different kinds of perspectives, um, if you will, that, that, that I have. I was uh, in public office for 22 years. I was the first mayor of the city of Annapolis, first woman mayor, and it elected in 300 years, and I served from 201 to 209. In the city of Annapolis, the mayor is the CEO, which is not always the same for municipalities, but it is true for, for the city of Annapolis, although that's been eroded a little <laughs> since, uh, since my term uh, in office. I graduated from Penn State University and from Galter College, so I have several different degrees, and uh, was selected three times as one of the outstanding women, uh, outstanding women in the state of Maryland, whatever that means. So I hope to bring, I tend to be, think out of the box a little bit, I tend to, tend to be innovative. Uh, on issues that a lot of people don't care much about that I think that are extraordinarily important to our quality of life and around uh, both education and the environment. Thank you. I'm Joel Greenwell. I live in, I live in Hardwood, Maryland. Next Friday, I'll be a resident of Avon County for 57 years. I, farm full time for a living and I also have a small excavation business. So Mr. Pittman is my, his farm is right next to my farm down in Hardwood and um, he talked to me about this and thought I would be a little good niche for this being in the construction and the farming. Um, I don't have any problems with development but it all needs to be done in the correct areas and revitalize what is sitting it's like you saw the night abandoned or disarray and you know, it needs to be fixed up. But we still got to preserve farmland. You know, our population is steady growing and it makes no sense taking productive farmland out of production with houses or buildings or whatever. But we all still have to eat. We got to eat healthy food. You know, a lot of food's being imported and whatnot from out of the country. It's going to be a good idea to get on this. It's going to be a good learning experience. We've got a good group of individuals here that we're working with. And it's going to be very knowledgeable. I think it's going to be a good time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> I'm up for a good time. <laughs> My name is Thomas Fars. Hello, everyone. Um, I work for Corporate Office Properties Trust, which is based in Columbia, Maryland. It's a full service real estate company. Uh, like Jamie, I'm a developer, I'm a proud developer of Class A high quality office block, much of which is then located here in Maryland County. But like Melanie, Melanie, um, I, I am a somewhat of, a, of an environmentalist. I, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I'm a lead credit professional and everything that we do has a, a sustainable nature to it. So I, I believe in that. And, I'm on the NAOP seat, I'm sitting in the NAOP seat, which means commercial development representation and such. So I'm interested in uh, bringing a developer's perspective, bringing a business perspective, and also really being viewed as part of the community. There's residential parts of the community, there's business parts of the community. We want to be seen as an equal. Uh, I appreciate diverse perspectives because everybody here is here for a reason they care, and it's, it's obvious to me. As do I, so I want to be part of that community and make Hanover County it is the best little place. Hello, everyone. Sorry I missed a couple of meetings. I have broken children. I'm Elizabeth Isla Light. I live in the community of Russell, Valley City, where I represent on this community of Florida. I am a 25 year resident of Anne Arundel County. I um, 
gave up like a Bethesda uh, house. Well, actually, no, I still, I still own it, but I rent it out for a lot of money. Um, <laughs> to move here. And uh, I am an attorney. I work in the real property, trust and estates, and, and employee benefits area. I, uh, my allocation is education. I currently serve on the Kerwin Commission, which is, you were wondering why I was asking education questions. Um, and I served for 10 years on the Maryland PTA board with two years as the state president. So education is important to me because children are our future. Oh, that probably was a song I heard somewhere. But uh, I do believe that uh, when we uh, plan our county, we should consider the residents that are coming behind us. And that's important to me. In the area that I live, on the other side of Fort Meade, as we were talking, um, two miles away from Prince George's County, one mile away from Howard County, not even. So that means that for our residents, we go to another county for services. For health services, they sent me to Howard County. For doctors, they sent me to Howard County as well. I would like to see our residents spend their money in our county as opposed to another county. And that's why I feel it's important for us to develop. I did, Gary, have an opportunity to serve early on on the Jessup Small Area Plan. And I still carry that around with me because there were a lot of IV, great ideas we had and we didn't get around to a lot of them. But there's still hope, right? Especially with law enforcement. Thank you. I decided to wrap it up. I'm Elizabeth Fosberg, and as you know, I'm your chair. So I have uh, been in Anne Arundel County, came back to Anne Arundel County in 2009. I've moved 18 times in 34 years as a military spouse. And as you can tell, I probably have a military structure. Um, <laughs> so uh, I live on the BNA Trail. In, uh, third, I'm the third generation to live on the property. Um, overlooking the water, my grandfather bought the property in 1956. So, um, and my brothers live there now too. So, um, and I also want you to know I have a house in Vermont, and the minimum acreage in Vermont is five acres per parcel. So, um, we live um, and enjoy that. So, uh, my goal here, I'm not going to um, be everybody's friend. Probably, I stick to a very um, There'll be good days and bad days, as I have said before. Why did I volunteer to do this as chair? I'm not exactly sure, but um, I wanted to make a difference, just like everybody else. And my goal is to see this go through, to see this adopted, to see it come to fruition, and to see it implemented, and not sit on the shelf. And that is really my goal. And codification is part of it as well. But it will take some from um, different bills to make it go through, obviously, one thing or another. But um, I was part of the previous plan, as some of us were, and asked to carry over to be part of this. So I appreciate what you all do. And I have to say that we did, I really did volunteer to have a cocktail party at my house. But then it would have been an open meeting, and then we would have been legal with one thing or another. So. I have to say that I did really try to do something social, but it's against over the rules. So I thank you all. I'm going to turn it over to Cindy and Tom <coughs> to wrap up. Um, name tags, if you want a different, shorter, abbreviated name, this is your opportunity to tell me tonight. Um, and otherwise, back to Phil and Cindy. And please, the other thing I want to tell you is we just had our first uh, visioning forum. Um, at Jessup on Monday, and we have BWI on Thursday. I hope all of you will be able to come in your area, come and visit, even next door to come and see what it's all about. I do need your help at those. Um, I am the moderator for the Q&A, and I need some help. I'm trying to study all 17 small areas so I know what's going on. But please be there so that I can have some support on that as well. Real quickly. Yeah, I, I said something to Cindy, but I'll just say it to you. I, I think it'd be nice if, if you gave a little time for CSC members to ask questions so people that 